Welcome to the fifth annual Wine Industry Technology Symposium. My name is Leslie Berglund, and I'm the co-chair of this event, along with my partner, Smoke Wallen. Smoke, raise your hand down there. Thank you. Um, we are thrilled to welcome so many of you here this year. When we started this event five years ago, we could all, some of you may remember, we could fit into the sweltering sun porch at Silverado Country Club. Um, we've actually had to move venues two times uh, to accommodate the increasing numbers. And actually, over the two days of the WITS event this year, we'll have close to 400 people, which is fantastic. Um, and that's up about 30% versus last year. So thank you all for being here and for your support. You know, given the state of the economy, um, there was times where like, God, are people actually going to show up? But, but of course you did because, you know, it's never more important than now to figure, to spend time figuring out um, how to work smarter, how to think outside of the box, how to change the game. And we've had a great group advisory board putting together the content this year that I believe is bringing through subjects that are really addressing that. Um, specifically, there's a group of winery CIOs who got together many times, literally starting last fall. And I wanted to do a special thanks to them. That's Bob Barnes from Corbell, John Collins from Fosters, David Clausen from Wente, Brian Sheldon from Francis Ford Coppola Presents, and Kurt Vanderwalk um, from Rodney Strong. So thanks for your generosity and creativity in putting this together. One of the unique things about this conference is who actually attends. And so about 36% of you are wineries, 33% um, are technology companies, 15% are other trade partners, and the rest wine industry professionals. Out of the wineries that are here, um, it's not all just technology leaders, as you can see from the people who are sitting, um, sitting around you. It is um, really an equal match between technology leadership and sales and marketing, 43% each, and the rest are general managers and CFOs. So we have a lot of decision makers in the room and thrilled to have you all here. Um, Another trend that's been really interesting is uh, people who are wineries that I'm calling WIT super users. And they're people who are sending eight, nine, ten people to this event. And um, that's becoming more and more popular. What we hear back from them is that they all divide and conquer when they're here and go to different sessions and then have a series of meetings back at the wineries afterwards um, about what they learned. And those wineries that fall into those um, buckets this year are Constellation, Gallo, Corbell, Fosters, Jackson Family Wine, and Rodney Strong, so thank you to our super users. That's really cool. Um, we have fabulous sponsors and expanded trade show showcase, technology showcase this year. Specific thanks to our gold sponsors, Oracle and the Wine Tasting Network, WTN Services. Also, special thanks to our silver sponsors, Wines and Vines Magazine and Submerse. Submerse are also our partners in video, um, doing the uh, video work this year, and so you'll be able to find different portions of WITS online. If they ask you for an interview, um, please, please accommodate. And it'll make it a lot of fun. Um, our bronze sponsors include Crossbow, Dimensional Insight, NetSpeed Solutions, ProWin, Intervictus, Interfruta, um, Sipa, Rogue IT, Nielsen, Practical Winery and Vineyard Management, Salesforce.com, Trade Pulse, UPS, Wine 2.0, Wine Business Monthly, and the Wise Academy. Then there are another 15 companies that are participants in the showcase, so um, please visit, uh, visit throughout the day. And we actually have the wine and coffee over there, so we know you will. <laughs> and um, now it is my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for this morning, Pete Blackshaw. Pete is EVP of Digital Strategic Services at Nielsen Online. Nielsen Online is a new entity combining Nielsen Buzzmetrics, which is a firm that Pete co helped co-found, as well as Nielsen Net Ratings. Pete's str strategy group works with many of the world's top brands and corporations to develop cohesive, consumer-centered digital programs and strategies. He's author of a recent book by Doubleday called Satisfied Customers Tell Three Friends, Angry Customers Tell 3,000. He also writes a column for Advertising Age on similar subjects. Um, more of Pete's accolades and accomplishments can be found in your um, in his bio, which is in your WITS program. And so please help welcome a fellow alumni of Harvard Business School of mine, Pete Blackshaw. OK. Um, <laughs> thanks so much for the invite. I'm absolutely uh, delighted to be here. Uh, we've been talking a lot about social media, the conversation. I actually uh, um, 
took a fresh look at my slides this morning because I thought yesterday's presentation uh, was outstanding, uh, especially from the Facebook uh, guys uh, about um, what's happening in this area. So I hope this is complimentary. There'll be a few areas that reinforce um, what you've heard, but that's good too because at the end of the day, we're all looking for momentum and energy to bring back to our organizations that probably have a fair share of skepticism about this area and to really move the needle. So I hope this is provocative. I am happy to follow up with any of you afterwards, as are my Nielsen colleagues, uh, related to anything I discussed. There's a ton more data behind all the little teasers I share with you. Um, so what are we going to talk about? There is a lot of talk out there about wine. Tons. I mean, probably more than you would ever imagine. Uh, and it will continue to grow as the consumer megaphone um, grows and proliferates. I think the big questions for us is, um, are you listening? And importantly, are you listening in the right way? Um, number two, um, are you relevant to the conversation? And this can be incredibly humbling. This can be um, often run against the grain of all of your assumptions. And sometimes you'll get really mad about who it is that's talking about um, you know, your wine or your winery. They're not in your target audience, but why do they have the standing? And why am I not mentioned? It's really important. Um, next, you know, are you participating and should you? You know, yes, there's a lot of talk about everyone's got to participate. In some cases, it may not make sense. It really depends on you know, where your product is and how good it is. Sometimes you may need to crawl under a rock versus say anything in this particular environment. And then, um, and then lastly, like, where do you start? And I'm going to give you a couple thought starters on where to start thinking about getting, really starting to move the needle in this particular area. Uh, just a quick word about, you know, uh, so I'm, I'm from Nielsen. We are kind of, we monitor uh, buzz, we monitor conversation, we have uh, monitor, um, you know, sales, we track inventory. Uh, you can hear a lot more about us at the booth over there. But what we're trying to do, and you'll see some of this in the slides, is really paint an integrated picture. And the one thing, whether you're using Nielsen or some other vendor, you can't look at buzz in a vacuum. When you start to marry it with other data sources, it takes on exponential value. Sometimes you have to normalize it based on sales or volume or your targeting strategy. But the more you can look at the full ecosystem of metrics as an overlay on top of buzz, number one, it's going to be a lot more persuasive. You'll get your management more engaged on what you're doing. And frankly, it's going to move you a lot closer to critical business decisions. Because at the end of the day, that's what this is all about. Not cool and sexy social media. This is about you know, driving volume, getting sales, deepening relationships with consumers. A couple of thought starters I wanted to uh, open up with. I, um, <laughs> I, so we had some analysts that were having a lot of fun looking at data. And a couple things kind of jumped out. And I just wanted to put it out there. Do not explain, expect a dissertation on the why factor, although some of the data will shed some light. So did you know, um, you know, we look across all the different venues where people talk about wine. There's a ton of conversation on the cruise websites. So if you want to burrow deep into figuring out, OK, can I get a couple insights? You know, the websites around cruises, which are huge pre-shopping pre areas where people really do a lot of due diligence before they you know, fork out the money, a lot of discussion about the wine. You may find that uh, a disproportionate amount of buzz about your wine is being driven there. Uh, two, um, wine is kind of mentioned often in desperation. It's really important to understand the context in which people talk about wine. So what we found is a lot of people are like, man, I had a crazy day. I need a Cabernet. Man, it was just nuts out there. I am just like stressed out. Um, I need a glass of wine. And not from a, I'm going to go become an alcoholic type of desperation, but just that little bit of tension. Now, why is that important? It provides aperture. Where are consumers most receptive to messaging? And this is where you need to get in the conversational group. And you know what? I won't say this categorically, because Tuesday may be different than Monday. It may be very, very in sync with the news flow. And this is where we all need to learn how to sense and respond. Really get into the groove of the conversation and respond accordingly. Um, you know, probably a no-brainer. But again, if you're making choices about where to start, because we can't do everything, paying a lot of attention to the, the proliferation of online recipe sites. Everyone's pairing up recipes with wines. That might be a really good 
starting place to figure it out. It may be the right place to start in terms of sponsorships or advertising. But again, as you look at the conversation, these things start to emerge. Um, bottles are very rarely mentioned. And I know we would love them to say, um, you know, Cabernet, you know, vintage, <laughs> XYZ, bottled, whatever. Uh, they just don't. And they generally kind of speak at a, at a very kind of, um, you, know, uh, uh, you know, I'm drinking Bonnie Dune, but they're not getting into the specific uh, bottle. I mean, and there's some exceptions out there, but again, you know, we all need to focus on, you know, what we think are the most dominant patterns out there. Um, boy, a uh, lot of discussion on boards and Twitter. Facebook is also really big and is growing, and obviously they have huge volume. But uh, there are many, many different places to speak. And we need to kind of figure out like where. Now, this is not categorical. It may be different on white versus red. This is kind of our blended, pun intended, average out there. But it's really important to understand the source of the conversation. Uh, red trumps wine. White probably makes a lot of sense. But it may be worth kind of peeling the onion a little bit to understand exactly why in what context. Maybe it's because you know, the red promoters of wine are doing a heck of a lot more job, better job driving buzz. We just don't know. But in the aggregate, that's the data. Um, French wines are mentioned more online. I'll put in a very interesting uh, piece of data in a few moments about that. Um, and then the other thing, and again, don't shoot the messenger. We're all here to learn. You know, I, I spent a lot of time looking at all the winery websites. Very few of you have transitioned to Web 2.0. You may think that you have. But again, I'm looking at it through the lens of what a lot of other folks are doing. Even like, you know, I even use like the Power Mom bloggers as a benchmark to kind of find out, okay, to what extent are the uh, wineries even close to where they are from a participation perspective. Okay, so that's the first start starter. A few things to think about in terms of the conversation. The second one is one of the things that we like to do at Nielsen. And it's always, sometimes people love it. Some people, sometimes people want to throw me off the stage. But we'll take all the conversation, um, and we'll put it in a blender, and we, we create what we call brand association maps. And so what we're looking for is like, how do consumers really talk about a brand, an issue, a theme, your competitor? Um, in, in what way? So what, we, so what you're looking at is a, uh, a map where you take a term like wine spectator, and you'll see the density of terminology that people use around it. So uh, as you see, you know, people will say, use the word, um, uh, you know, wine advocate is most closely associated with the term wine spectator. So people are doing some compare and contrast. And then there's also similarities if you see clusters out there where you see Merlot, Chardonnay, Pinot, the map also kind of clusters like themes together. Now, this is important because all of us, whether you're using Nielsen or doing it yourself, should really understand your brand DNA. How do people talk about your brand? And again, this can be very sobering. This can be very upsetting. In fact, a lot of our clients who have luxury brands get really ticked off when we put association maps and like low tier brands are used in association with theirs. But it's very important to understand how the conversation maps out. And of course, it varies by cluster. It may be different with Twitter versus boards versus Facebook. Now, so what's interesting about MindSpecter, kind of traditional associations. It looks pretty intuitive. So you probably say, Pete, not a lot of big ahas here. Um, I would characterize this as kind of the expected um, vernacular wine speak. Now it gets kind of interesting when you move over to um, Barry Vaynerchuk, who um, has obviously become just a, a very powerful force, keynote speaker last year, um, crazy at times, but clearly persuasive, have massive audience. And it's interesting when you look at the conversation related to this influencer in the marketplace, and a couple things kind of emerge. Um, you know, number one, you kind of see that, you know, he's inseparable from dialogue about social media. I mean, yes, he's a wine critic, and he has a wine blog, but, but he's also really in the groove of the new media. And in fact, you know, when people talk, of, you know, they talk about him almost as much as a social media innovator, as much as a wine expert. And I think that helps him. That gets him into the groove. You also noted, I thought it was also interesting that the things that would be closer to the center for wine spectator are kind of even further out in the periphery than a lot of the social media vernacular. And why is this important? I mean, we're all trying to figure out how to get into the conversation. It may 
be useful to us to do some benchmarking with the folks that are making a lot of waves in the marketplace and really kind of dissect the conversation like what is he doing that's driving buzz now this next slide is really interesting and and one of the questions I posed to the Facebook guys yesterday was, boy, to what extent, before you even do your Facebook site, should you just make sure that you have a really good home base? And I would say, um, that's another view on this, but let me kind of, what's interesting about Gary is that he really knows how to leverage his website as a launching pad for all the other social media activities. And it's interesting when you do a compare and contrast with Wine Spectator. Um, you know, you look at Wine Spectator site, there's not a lot of social media stuff. I mean, it's not like click to send, go to Facebook. You know, it's kind of what you would expect from a standard um, publisher. And, I, and of course, they're the gold standard. They're very, very important. But here you've got this guy that popped out of nowhere. You know, not out of nowhere, but literally has been on a rocket you know, ship path. And you kind of look at his website. What's the very first thing you see on there? He's basically um, follow me on Tumblr, Twitter, you know, subscribe RSS. He's got all his little videos. He's got every single Today Show snippet that he's ever been on. You know, the things that typically drive a lot of conversation. He realizes that his website is really an incubator of conversation. Conversation drives media. Media penetrates the psyche of others, drives awareness and trial. And here you've got a relatively new player in this influential wine zone that has really driven a tremendous amount of awareness, and I'll put some more data on that in a moment. So a couple things about the landscape. So we've got a couple thought starters. A couple things I'll say about the landscape today. You know, consumers are in control, absolutely no question, but not total control. And I think when I see all the vendors out there in the other room talking about CRM, I think that's a way of saying you still have control, but it's a different type of control. I don't believe paid media is reliable as it used to be. I think we may have to focus more on relationship marketing and really deepening that, which again, I think the wine industry has always done an exceptional job um, at, but now it's a whole different context of online um, intimacy, if you will. I think when we think about Web 2.0 and, you know, in kind of um, blogs, you know, think agility and flexibility. You know, my training in marketing was at Procter & Gamble where we got a lot of stuff done. But I got to tell you, we very rarely iterated because it cost us a couple million dollars to build websites. And in order to change the website, it would cost us another half a million dollars. And so it never paid out to iterate. So you'd end up flatlining in innovation. What's really happening today is that we have a fundamentally more open, flexible publishing format where consumers are the true inspiration for innovation. I mean, I look every day with great humility at all the power moms out there that are literally changing their website five times a week and are literally telling me, hey, dude, everything you learned at Procter & Gamble about it's going to take you a year to do your first online iteration is bogus because I can sense, I can respond, I don't have to have all my research right on the front end. And so what we need to think about is how do we learn from these consumer content creators to inspire new models for how we create content. It's a big deal because we all feel the temptation to get everything right up front. I guarantee you Gary did not get rid of everything right up front. He's a very good listener. He sensed, he responded, he adapted, he got it right. It doesn't mean you need to like shoot blindly at first, but don't be hesitant to um, be partially right up front and then just continue to kind of, you know, groove as you go. I think that's a very important lesson from consumers. Um, video and a mobile have arrived. You can download refrigerators off the web. It's amazing. Big deal for you because benefit visualization is incredibly important. You've got these beautiful wineries. You've got these beautiful bottles. You've got these incredible people. Leverage the sight, sound, and motion that they bring to the table. Trust me, it's more persuasive than text. Um, search is rewriting the roles of brand equity. Um, whether you like it or not, or whether it's fair or not, your brand equity today is the sum total and composition of your search results. It's a big deal. Early reviews really matter. They get the link love. Link love gets disproportionate share on Google. Google drives awareness. Google makes markets or all search engines. And you got to be really sensitive, and especially the negative stuff. We make a lot of money serving companies that have just been brought to their knees because nasty grams are showing up on Google when you type in words like, you know, brand plus customer service. So we really got to think about how, you know, uh, attitudes are shaped in a world of search. Um, 
huge dependency of online and offline content. We used to love to talk this in silo, you know, those offline guys versus us. I mean, every reporter today, even in the wine trade, probably has a cheat sheet of bloggers or Twitters that they use to kind of fuel their input. In fact, it's getting crazy today. Like every single, I saw a list of all the top, I think there's like 30 New York Times reporters that now have Twitter accounts. I mean, everything is commingled. Similarly, every single TV show echoes online. In fact, I think half the entertainment of watching TV is like, yeah, forget the time shifting. It's a, let's, let's, let's see how people are reacting to Jack Barr at this very moment. I mean, that's like half the entertainment. So there's a great growing dependency taking place, and that's an opportunity. That's a really, really big opportunity for us. Um, personal branding blends with corporate branding. For some companies, probably a big headache because the personal brands are a little bit tough to control. On the other hand, I think a lot of companies are, you know, the, the, the more credible, uh, trusted face of the employee, the passionate employee, the knowledgeable employee is getting across. And I think for a lot of brands, that's a breakthrough. And I know having visited a lot of your wineries, you've got great people, you know, kind of serving customers, listening, and those are great assets. And maybe that, maybe there's life for them, you know, in the web 2.0 space. Um, and then most importantly, and this is a big one, and this is an area where I just know this industry has a right to win. Service is the new marketing. It is so difficult to message to consumers the old way. And they are empowered. They are impatient. We need to serve them. We need to listen to them. We need to dignify them. We need to be eth empathetic. So the whole notion of service, far from being this non-strategic cost center activity, might just be the most important body of activity. And I don't say this as Pete Blackshot conjecture. I've been monitoring online activity for the last 10 years. When I look at what drives the buzz for conversations from small businesses all the way up to Comcast, Toyota, uh, Unilever, Bank of America, it's how they serve consumers. Consumers play that back in droves. And it's really important to understand what are the true drivers of conversation. There's a lot of hype and bad information in the marketplace about we can all create buzz overnight. Not true. Buzz typically emanates from the things that you're already doing. That's what I loved about those guys from Facebook. They really kind of grounded us in a lot of the fundamental truths of the way we should be running business. Um, you know, what's motivating and inspiring? Let me just personalize this, because I think we can learn really fast if we just personalize what we're already doing. These are some examples of some content that I've created. Pete, the consumer, not Pete, the guy from Nielsen, um, created a website called dosebebes.com, and my wife and I had twins. I got to tell you, I'm from a family of seven kids. I have five righteous sisters. If I can get one or two attaboys from my sisters on my website, I am psyched. And, and it's a very important insight because we all look at these, we look at our kids, we look at others, like they're running the Twitter to figure out whether they got friended or someone validated. A lot of this is about basic, raw consumer validation. And, and as we develop our strategies, what's making consumers feel important? How are we validating them? How are they boosting their self-esteem? Um, desire to connect with one another, make change. Um, you know, shortly before my father passed away, I, um, we had this incredible bonding moment over the, the TV show Mad Men. And he, was, he started at BBDO in 1960, and for whatever reason, just like, opened up this conversation. So I videotaped them and put it online. And before I knew it, characters from Mad Men were like using my dad as market research. Um, and, um, and other people were kind of discovering it. But I, I almost kind of came to another appreciation of the power of online video as a storytelling. Um, vehicle that I hadn't even, even the Nielsen data hadn't made obvious to me. So again, the personal connections are important. You know, recently my family and my wife and uh, we created a site called Kuchina.com that if I had tried to build when I was at Procter & Gamble, it would have cost me millions of dollars, but we were able to leverage the power of like Web 2.0 to create a place where we could put up videos that kind of allowed us, less about recipes, more about sharing stories. I mean, just to give a perspective. And again, we connect with this. So here's like my, um, I don't know if this is going to work or not, but let's see here. So, you know, example of like, uh, you know, here's my, my younger sister, Anne, one of the five righteous sisters who basically is, um, um, so that's used with iMovie. So again, very easy to produce things you couldn't produce before. There's my sister giving one of her favorite recipes and along the way giving a story. And, and this notion of storytelling is repeating itself all over the web. And I think this is an area where this industry can not only win, I think you can bust off, what, the cork? 
um, of just about anybody out there, because I think wine is an area that really brings out the storytelling. Obviously, it's great product, but there's always an experience that wraps around, um, ra you know, wraps around, um, you know, uh, drinking wine. Um, I think in this context, we have to think credibility. And I won't get into the, the book that I just wrote is all about, you know, how do we protect credibility, how do we nurture credibility in, a, in an environment where the consumer's in control? And I think there's six drivers we really need to chisel on our foreheads. You know, trust, transparency, authenticity, listening, responsiveness, affirmation is if you type in, you know, Cabernet into Google, either it's affirmed or it's not by the reviews. Um, you know, trust, you just can't you don't get many, any, you don't get more than a swing at the bat on trust. If you lose the trust, it's very difficult to get it back. Authenticity, I think the brands that come across as less like advertisers, less like salespeople, more like real people. Um, third person to first person, formal to informal, long form to short form. Those are the brands that are getting the dividends. Easier said than done. Transparency is a tough one. Brands are pulling their hair out on this, but you know, we need to make some real big choices. Like if you go to a brand search engine and you type in something like, you know, Cabernet and problems, do you fire back a blank or do you, and, and risk them going to Wikipedia or Truth or go, go to the activist search engine? We have to make some really important choices because very little cannot be discovered on the web. Wikipedia is growing like crazy and the, one of my favorite exercises is look at, you know, what, what indexes into Wikipedia. You know, Wikipedia is now like one, two, or three in search results for every brand practically in the world, which means whether you think it's fair or not, it's, it's, it's getting a lot of link love, and that's really impacting a lot of perceptions. Um, listening and responsiveness, again, I think this notion of showing empathy is paying huge dividends. I'll talk more about that in a moment. Uh, a word about affirmation. You know, think about, here's a simple framework, you know, think speakers and seekers, you know, about 60% of consumers are now creating content, you know, they're flooding, you know, the archives with personal experiences, and then you've got seekers, and that's practically 100%. Everyone is using search as, at some level in the buying process. So think about this as, you know, at P&G, everything was about category management, what shows up on the shelf, and we need to ask ourselves, is the search, you know, what, what if the shelf is suddenly negative? Does that move us further away from the brand. And again, this is what's happening all over your category. Okay, why, you know, why is a shelf the way it is? Is that because I had a bad web strategy? Maybe I didn't discover conversational marketing for a long time, which is a mistake because conversation drives link love. Link love improves shelf. Um, so, you know, and then how important is, you know, searching? So here's some Nielsen data. This is monthly data, you know, rolled up. A lot of people are searching, and importantly, the numbers are going up. You know, so we've got a pretty impressive increase from 2008 to 2009 in terms of number of searches going up. Even when people are typing in the word winery or a close approximation, that's going up as well. Does that matter to you? You bet, because they could land, you know, on your winery or on a one of those cool engines that allows you to make an appointment. <laughs> but the reality is that there's a curiosity piece and what's happening is a lot of the speakers, and here's a few examples where I looked at um, you know, a few of the popular blogs, I looked at a combination of posts plus comments, you know, but they're beginning to shape the shelf. And I think the first thing we need to do before we even you know, really go crazy on actionability with, with um, social media is really understand, okay, What's my position on shelf and why? And who's influencing it? You know, good examples of communities that are out there. I won't get into too many specifics, but they're growing. They're, gro they're growing, and I think that's a great opportunity. In fact, I think all those cool innovations we heard about yesterday at Facebook are just going to jack the numbers up even more. I think mobile applications are going to, you know, where you can literally you know, go to the winery, kind of take a photo, put it up on your website, or put it on the well, Wine 2.0 group. Again, all those things are going to increase participation. You need to figure out how to play in that place. Um, a little bit of a deeper dive on wine buzz. So, you know, this is pretty interesting. We're looking at, um, you know, consumer-generated media trend for wine um, across the different platforms as a percentage of all buzz. You know, co clearly Twitter has seen the biggest increase. And this is largely consistent with just adoption. It's just kind of found a tipping point. It continues to grow. Will it flatten? Maybe. Um, 
but uh, that's very, very important. So again, as you're making choices, you may want to you know, anchor your first strategy to where you're seeing the largest amount of growth. And I'll show you another piece of data that'll reinforce that a little bit more. Um, how does that compare to beer? You got to do benchmarking, right? Um, so um, again, Twitter's where you're seeing the buzz um, you know, out there. But let me kind of, here's what's even more interesting. I, I love this chart. Um, you know, different beverages, different foods, different brands kind of have a different conversational quotient based on where it's taking place. So, um, so if you look at share of voice for wine, um, you know, Twitter's got a growing share relative to beer. Now, I don't have all the answers as to why. Maybe Twitter's more sophisticated. Um, but, you know, that's a, good, that's a good thing to dive into. You know, and then again, I was looking at, you know, I saw some of your, uh, who, what was it, wine twit? 35,000 followers, I was pretty impressed. I mean, you've got a growing community of, of, um, of, of Twitters that are really kind of bringing their passion to the table. Again, it doesn't mean the blogs are important. In fact, a lot of the Twitter, you know, you could say that Twitter is a marketing tool to promote your blog. It's all kind of cross-fertilizing. But it's very, very important to understand where the conversation is. Now, for some of you, it may be a completely different composition. It may vary red versus white versus type of winery. You know, maybe there may be demographic dynamics taking place as well. <coughs> um, not so surprising here, but it's always interesting to look at sales data juxtaposed with buzz. Um, lower sales for, you know, here we kind of um, uh, looked at, um, you know, share of sales relative to buzz. Um, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, France less on the, you know, percentage of overall sales, but very, very high on buzz. Um, you know, relative to other regions. And again, it's very important to understand, like, you know, why, you know, what's the trend? Does that vary by Twitter versus boards? We didn't get into that for this analysis. But again, you want to know. I mean, what's driving it? I guess, again, the more you can sync up with the conversational vibes, the more effective your advertising is going to be. Now, some of it may be negative, too. A lot of times brands see crazy negatives because, you know, there's a controversy out there. You know, what's the big controversy about whether it's burnt rubber or whatever, you know, rumors are out there. But, you know, those things can do a lot of damage and you want to know whether those are spiking. Now, here's pretty interesting. The nice thing about text mining is that you can really get into polarity or sentiment or favorability. You know, so is it favorable or not? So this one's kind of interesting where, um, you know, you see that the Argentina wines are kind of like spiking on, not, not necessarily spiking, but I'd say they're over-indexing the average on favorable buzz. You know, a lot of it is very neutral. People haven't rendered an opinion. Um, where they do sort of say it's great or it's not, you'll typically see those in ratings and reviews, and that's very important. They tend to index extraordinarily high. Um, the France one is kind of interesting, and I may ask one of my Nielsen colleagues to correct me if I get this wrong, but um, People aren't quite sure what to say. It may be an intimidation factor. It may be a lack of knowledge around you know, you know, what it is. It drives a lot of conversations. But um, I don't know. How would I describe that? Brian, what am I missing on that, that piece of data? Where'd Brian go? Yeah, so there, yeah. So, and again, the question for all of us is like, what currency can we provide the talkers so that they can be a little bit more authoritative, maybe a little less dissonance, and offer an opinion one way or the other. And maybe it's as simple as reminding them what other people have said. You know, again, so think about, you know, what's the, people are talking, what are you doing to provide uh, meaningful, and again, this is where corporate blogs and the like can make a big difference. Um, you know, this is pretty interesting where what's hot in sales is also what's hot in online buzz. Not, you know, some of that kind of makes sense, but here's some areas, whether it's uh, Chile, Argentina, New Zealand, you know, very large, you know, sales increases correlating with high buzz levels. And again, some of this may strike you as very intuitive, but where you do start to see some disconnects, like, hmm, that doesn't make sense, that's where you want to peel the layers and understand what's kind of going on there and might that impact things. The other thing that's really important is that more and more retailers are getting crazy savvy about social media. In fact, Walmart has bloggers. They have buyers that blog now. You know, so what you see online is what they see. And of course, you know, as you're kind of doing the sell through about distribution and like, you gotta be really, really sensitive about, or, or you may wanna ride the momentum of the good news. Like, hey, you can't say no, there's proof positive all over the web. But you also have to be sensitive about the fact that they may see the nasty grams before you even know about them. Um, and now let's go back to the influencers, for example. So this was kind of interesting. Look at Gary, Wine Spectre, Robert Parker, 
you know, food, wine, you know, it's, you know, what do you look at? I mean, I do pay a lot of attention to Google search results. I think that's a very good starting point. And the fact that, um, you know, it's kind of amazing that, you know, Wine Spectre has been around for a while, um, but it's amazing, again, this new guy, um, you know, just in a couple of years is like literally at a quarter of all indexable content kind of implicates his content. And I think a big reason is that this guy is just a social media uh, maven. I mean, he really knows how to leverage the platform. You know, Robert C Parker, by contrast, you know, smaller level, but I don't want to take away from that because clearly he is an esteemed authority and, you know, you know even the web's not going to take take that much away from that. But, you know, it's interesting. I like to look at Wik Wikipedia links in, how many people link into his Wikipedia content, um, how many Twitter followers. That is a massive number. Um, Anybody who gets to that, you know, blog references since, you know, 318. Again, that's, that's pretty interesting. I mean, that, that one I would pay a lot of attention to. The fact that um, blogs cite him more than Wine Spectator linked directly to his site, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's an important leading indicator. I think links are a very important sign of your credibility. And I think we should all be trying to figure out how do we use our content as currency. The reality is that Gary, his content fuels other blogs gives them meaning to write about things. And I think that's partly what we want to do. How do we fuel other people's stories? And again, you have a right to win. You have great stories. Um, what's going on with the wine bloggers? I won't get into all the specifics here. But again, different ways of cutting the data. We all may have different criteria. But you can look at things like search results, Twitter followers, blog references, amount of past comments, Wikipedia links. We're actually, and maybe you'll be the beta test next week, we're going to start doing peer review. We actually think some degree of survey re work is really important too. We may, you know, send a, you know, send Leslie a survey and say, name the top ten influencers that you, uh, that you uh, online influencers that you think are important, and we'll blend that into the scorecard. But again, lots of different ways of doing it. But I'll tell you this: you really need to know who the influencers are, okay? And they don't always line up with just your buyer set, but they influence perceptions. Some of them may strike you as like, oh my gosh, I cannot believe I'm catering to this person, but. They can drive a lot. They can create a lot of interference in the system. Um, I did an experiment the other day, uh, a couple days ago. Some of you participated. Um, and I don't have a lot of followers. I think I have like, you know, maybe 4,500 followers on Twitter. But I posted something. And I said, hey, I'm giving a keynote speech. Name, um, you know, name a few wines that you like. And again, some of you may be saying, I cannot believe that made the list. But it is what it is. I mean, this is the way the social networks work. So what I did is I, could, I looked at um, the Twitter author. And then I looked at their, I ranked it by number of followers. And I think that's important. I mean, if someone's giving you a, a review and they've got a lot of followers, I think that's very, very important. So, you know, La Crema, you know, did uh, very, very well, you know, the number one follower. But you can look at the different ones that are dialing up there. One guy threw in two buck Chuck. He might have been trying to get a little viral lift out of his comment. Not really sure. Um, but this was purely open end. Name the last three wines that you've recommended. We probably need a lot more science around that. And again, some of that's going to be really sobering. And some of you are going to be kicking and screaming, saying, I just can't believe that. That doesn't make sense. Some of you may be saying, right on, my social media strategy worked. Others may say, it's just validating what we know. We have great product. But again, different ways of learning from this platform. Here is. So a couple suggestions on, OK, so what do we do? Um, I think you know, we really got to figure out how to listen. And it doesn't mean you need to go have the Rolls Royce listening solution. You know, even before you, you know, we can help you at many, many levels. But even if you're not willing to make the investment, you can go to some of the you know, free search engines and just kind of start to get a feel for what's out there. There's huge value in many, many different areas. And I would put them into two different buckets, one on the research side, one on the marketing side. On the research side, Insight Driver, there are huge untapped insights. And I think insights are incredibly powerful when they're unprompted. You know, it's not like the marketer's throwing a question their way. They're just volunteering it. Um, efficiency catalyst. It might be a better substitute for more costly processes. Again, the web is turning out to be an incredible focus group. We should be tapping into that. Vitamin boost is it might just be not a replacement, but an enhancement. I think about Proctor. Sometimes when I did Hispanic focus groups in Miami, sometimes it wouldn't be until the fifth day that we would figure out the right questions to ask. So one of the things, like, before we put really costly research out there, how do we use the web to just make sure that we're tuned into the right issues? And then on the marketing side, I think driving advocacy is really important. What are the big advocacy drivers? You know, what, what are the talk drivers that make people talk? And you might totally re-engineer your marketing strategy around trying to give those talk drivers lift. 
Insurance underwriters, sometimes you just can't afford not to listen, and a lot of brands are listening purely on that basis. Too many financial analysts are dipping in. Engagement meter, where is it appropriate? Sometimes it's completely not appropriate to engage, and we need to have our finger on the pulse. Um, there's a whole spectrum of engagement. A lot of different places to play. You don't need to do it all. The one area I would tell you is you got to get your core customer service right first. In fact, I tweeted today, I said, social media tip of the day, don't do a thing on social media until you call your 800 number. Because here's the deal, like bloggers and Twitters, they're hyper attentive. I mean, they, they spot every disconnect, every contradiction, you know, and you don't want to create a conversational divide where the folks that are managing the call center are completely detached from all the marketing hype about social media. And trust me, there's a lot of that. And it's making brands look like they're walking around with two heads, duplicitous, not really sincere. So get your core foundations right. And the good news is I think you really already take you know, you really take that very seriously. But so um, then we can move into other areas. I do think, listen, Twitter is not going to drive a zillion cases. But it might give you some very good learning around sense and respond. I think the ultimate dividend on Twitter is really about driving cultural adoption. You can start it tomorrow. You can start it yesterday. OK, you can start to give people training and the like. Um, forums and communities. I think, my gosh, I think every winery should have its own community. Maybe it's facilitated by Facebook. Maybe you're using a Ning site. I don't really care. But you've got devoted club members. They want to talk. They may want to talk on an exclusive basis. You can do this stuff at a much lower cost than you ever could before. So there's no excuse. And some, you know, sometimes a small community, I have a community of clients, 150 of them, that are using an you know, a online community platform. I am getting so much knowledge from them. 150 clients, that's it. I'm not going for the big numbers, but they are so infinite, it's so infinitely revealing of what they want, what they don't like, where they want to go. So don't underestimate the potential of even a small community. Corporate blogging, no brainer, easy to do. I don't even know if the word blog is going to be in our vernacular in a year from now, but the whole notion of the flexible, you know, real time narrative, I think that's very important. Blogging on other sites, yeah, you may need a strategy for occasionally going into, you know, uh, righteouswineblogger.com and sort of saying, dude, uh, you got your facts wrong. And that's OK. But you may have to knock on their door and ask for permission, or there's a whole language of finesse. But this is what I call the spectrum of engagement. We should all be playing in a couple of these zones. Not all of them. Be very careful about overselling this. You'll curse yourself. You'll put yourself on a 10-year you know, trajectory of flatlining. But go for some good wins, and you'll, you'll find, and really focus on how to move your organization with you. That is the most important thing. Um, hey, warm up the welcome mat, folks. Again, I, I picked a few examples. Do not shoot the messenger. You're all like this. You're all like this. I looked at every single one. You know, I've done research with consumers where I've said, OK, if this feedback form were a person, who would it be? Who do you want them to be? You want to be the concierge. In most cases, consumers go back and say, government employee. OK, so think about the impressions you establish with consumers at the moment of truth when you ask them their opinion. OK, most company, most wineries ask all the demographics before they ask what they're feeling. Now, juxtapose that with the world of Twitter, where you pretty much got to get your feelings across in 140 characters. You know, and so what are the new expectations? How do we retrofit that to the way that we message to consumers? What impressions does that establish? Um, how does that build equity and the like? Um, Rethink your purchase funnel. It's different. It's different. OK, it's not just awareness, consideration, trial, purchase, you know, uh, loyalty. There's a whole education and curiosity. People <laughs> serendipitously stumble into the winery or the wine or the recommendation. It's pre-awareness. You know, and that's where driving conversation is so important. What Unilever did that was so brilliant that didn't get the media attention around Dove Evolution, they created like, you know, five million roads to beauty care. You could type in the word self-esteem and you would land on the Dove Real Beauty ad. You know, so they really won on the curiosity side. They created this massive funnel to the brand. So don't just think brand, think about higher order benefits. What's the conversation that you can create around it? Um, and then post loyalty, there's advocacy. And this is so important. Loyalty is no longer enough. Consumers are leaving a digital trail post loyalty. And let me give you an example of how to frame that. So if you're trying to put together the ROI model for you know, the skeptical, you know, whoever it is in your organization. Just get beyond the lifetime value modeling. I think all of you do a great job of figuring out, oh my gosh, if Pete's loyal to Bonnie Dune for X amount of time, I'm going to be worth a lot of money. But it's bigger than that. Um, 
you know, it's bigger. What I, if you look at the right side, that's what I call the referral spectrum. A loyal customer may also have a high propensity to leave a review, um, go to a feedback or complaint site, and go to Twitter, upload a photo, maybe even, if you're lucky, put up a video review and say, I want to be like Gary, and let me tell you why this wine rocks. And that can really matter. Okay, and that, leaves, that creates value. So we may need to create a whole new model for how we value a consumer. Now, it's important to figure out those models because we may end up spending a little bit more on the front end to get those consumers in the pipeline because we realize there's a much longer you know, dividend that, that's reaped from it. So think about, think about a new model where we think about lifetime value plus you know, virality and advocacy. And again, you know, and again, kind of upgrade participation, downside pr promotion. A lot of the sites are very promotional. That's good. There's essential information you have to get across. But take a look at these sites that you have and just ask yourself, where could I ask people to participate? Could I make it easy for them to send this cool piece of information to Twitter? Again, you don't need people actually. I go look at your local newspaper. They're all desperately trying to figure out ways of kind of keeping themselves on a uh, lifeline of conversation. And there's a lot of tools out there that you can embed on your site that kind of keep conversation alive, so to speak. Um, so, you know, go back and kind of do a little critique. Um, and then lastly, I, I think it's really important that we start to think about a model of balancing paid versus earned media. All media is important. Cons you know, it, it, it drives awareness. It lets people know that you're, you know, you're selling product. But we just don't buy it. And we, we, we obviously, a lot of money goes on the buy side, but a growing number of it is going on the earn side. And the question is, you know, what are the inputs to getting earned media? It may be customer service. It may be great product. Maybe a little bit of media stokes the fire, which happens all the time. It's amazing how much people talk about copy. It's amazing how often you see people using their iPhones to kind of look at billboards and throw them online. So the point is that a lot of things can input this, but it's, as we think about what we might call media mix modeling 2.0, we've got to really think about the balance between you know, the paid and the earned. And I really think this applies as much to the small business as it does to the really, really big player out there. If, um, so that kind of covers it. We have time for a few questions? A couple? Uh, I, I will say that if, if you're interested in learning more, I've got a lot of the stuff in my book. There's, um, you know, the Nielsen Wire has a lot of data. And if some, if some of you are our clients, we have a, a, a platform where you can dig into this. But I'd be happy to help you afterwards in any way. Questions, comments, feedback, complaints? Oh, come on. I can't, like, I'm going to tweet the fact that I didn't get any questions. Yes, please. <laughs> Well, it's difficult. I think you have to know. Oh, yeah, sure. The question is, what do you think about um, posting or editing your own entries? Well, I mean, everybody can try. <laughs> um, I, I've had senior executives practically cry on my lap because they have not um, been able to get anything approved. It's a pretty tough crowd. You can't be a shell for yourself. It's always better to leverage third-party data. So if there's a New York Times article or a Robert Parker review or someone else um, you know, wrote something favorable about you. Those are the things, you know, if, you, if you're well linked to other content, the likelihood of it sticking on Wikipedia will go up dramatically. Now, there may be some things that are truly your knowledge base and no one else's. This is how you make the wine. Um, but in some cases, they may not even think you merit an entry. Um, and I've, I've learned the hard way. It's actually been pretty, pretty humbling. But, but if there is credentialed information, I think you should have the ability to kind of get that out there. It is very important to have people uh, focusing on that. And you may have to have a three-year roadmap, but Wikipedia is really important. Yes, please. Question about brand image yeah. and how you convey that or protect that in a Twitter post or a Facebook status update if you've got those two accounts integrated. Do you feel like that is really important? <coughs> and how do you do it when you're limited to 140 characters <laughs> and you have to, you know, it's yeah. an environment that seems to be, you know, it's very social. Mm -hmm. But if you have a brand that considers themselves to be, you know, have a certain look and feel yeah. to everything, how do you convey that in these conversations? Well, it's harder. Well, the question is, you know, how do you deal with brand image um, in this particular environment? And, it's, and it's, 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 it's not that it's difficult. It just requires a habit change. The reality is that we are letting, up, we are letting um, go of some control, and we're trusting that the evangelism of our fans will kind of create an even better image for us. You know, that said, I do think there's some tactical things you can do to increase odds. Like all of you, if you haven't done it already, 
you know, just make sure that, even if you're not going to do Twitter for a year, go register your brand on Twitter before some joker does it for you. Um, you know, those things, in, even if you think you have a legal right to do it, it could be a pain in the butt trying to unwind those things. Same thing with Facebook. So, and those things are important to image because you'll be bumming if someone else, you know, has your brand name um, when that's what you want. You, want, you don't want to have a cryptic brand name that people have to remember. So I get that in place. And listen, I think the way you shape image is by managing the conversation. And if people are going south, they're going in the wrong direction, you have to use the skills of the conversationalist to kind of get it back on track. So it's, and, and I think you're going to learn that over time. There's some things you're just, you know, people are going to post things that are just absolutely hostile, and that's the way the world is. But I think that if you're proactive, you can decrease odds. And if you truly have a good product, you should be in a very good position to reap the benefits of better imagery. Good question. Please. Yeah. Yeah, great question. So, yeah, so to what extent is Nielsen pushing the frontiers of influence? I mean, boy, more than I can keep track of. Um, and it's hard because you kind of want to just put your body on a marker and say, this is the way we measure influence. But, you know, social graphs have become like the big uh, buzzword uh, de jure. And you're absolutely right. I mean, there is like influence several steps removed. You know, a lot of times the interesting analysis is not how many people followed those folks. And that graph I showed is like, who's in their circle of influence? And what's that? How many of those are fan followers? Exa oh, exactly. And there's a lot of gaming of the system. But yeah, um, a lot. Have we converged on the perfect methodology? No. I feel like we keep having to kind of expand our definition of influence. A year ago, we weren't really taking Twitter that seriously. How can you not take Twitter seriously now? Um, even segments is getting more complicated because now all the traditional media are leveraging social media. So now we have to create this new segment called Media Writers Who Twit. <laughs> Beware. <laughs> okay, thanks very much. I'll stick around.